with business. Uh, I will have more to say, but I have been joined by a couple of my colleagues uh, who are concerned about this, who have been working in this arena, who have some proposals. Uh, and I would fir turn first to my colleague from Maryland, uh, Mr. Delaney, uh, who has been working in this space, uh, adding to the conversation in a way to help us move forward. And I would be happy to yield to him for some comments. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and thank uh, you, my good friend from Oregon, for your <coughs> really singular leadership on this issue um, and your unwavering commitment to make sure these problems get solved. So, Mr. Speaker, every uh, two years, the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers does an analysis of the U.S. infrastructure needs and an assessment of our infrastructure as it relates to our competitors around the world. And in this last uh, analysis they did, they produced a report card where they graded each component of U.S. infrastructure. And they also gave us a, a composite grade, and that grade was a D plus. A D plus, Mr. Speaker, was the grade that the U.S. infrastructure received from the American Society of Civil Engineers. And they estimated further <clears throat> that the amount of investment we would need to make as a country to bring our infrastructure up to a high standard is three to four trillion dollars. Three to four trillion dollars, Mr. Speaker, is the gap, the investment gap in the infrastructure in the United States of America. This creates a very significant challenge for us as a nation as we look to compete in a global and technology-enabled world. And to successfully compete in a global and technology-enabled world, you need world-class transportation, energy, communications, infrastructure, to be able to compete successfully. <clears throat> but it also creates a great opportunity for us as a nation, because investing in our infrastructure is proven to be one of the great jobs programs in this country. It creates middle-skilled jobs. Infrastructure disproportionately creates middle-skilled jobs, which is what we need in this country. We're actually creating high-skilled jobs at a decent rate. We're creating low-skilled jobs at a decent rate. But we're not creating middle-skilled jobs for middle-class Americans, the kind of Americans that built this country, saved this country, and saved the world. And that's a great tragedy. And investing in our infrastructure will do that. It also happens to pencil out, Mr. Speaker. Across time, the data strongly suggests that for every dollar we spend on infrastructure, we get $1.92 of economic benefit as a nation. So it'll create jobs in the short term, it'll make us more competitive in the long term, and it's a fundamentally good investment for us to make as a country. And as we think about filling this infrastructure hole, we should analyze how we actually invest in infrastructure in this country. And there's really four ways we do it. First, government, federal government, state governments, and local governments actually grant money to build infrastructure, particularly infrastructure that is used for the public or common good. And that's an important role of government. And government is unique in its ability to do that. The second way we build infrastructure is through financing it with user fees. Things like the Highway Trust Fund that my colleague referred to has largely been financed through a gas tax. And there's other examples at airports, et cetera, where we charge user fees and that money is collected and we build infrastructure with it. The third way we build infrastructure in this country is through public-private partnerships, where we go to the private sector and for certain types of infrastructure, we get the private sector to build the infrastructure. And then finally, the fourth way we build infrastructure is we finance it. In other words, State governments and local governments borrow money to build infrastructure. These are the four ways we build infrastructure in this country. And if we actually want to close this infrastructure investment gap that we have, if we actually want to close this 3 to $4 trillion gap, if we want to bring our infrastructure from a D-plus grade to something we'd be more proud of, like an A grade, we need to be bolstering all four of these methods. But the good news, Mr. Speaker, is that there are bipartisan ways of doing all of these things. And that's what we need to focus on. One example of, bipartisan, of a bipartisan solution to this problem is a piece of legislation that I introduced with several colleagues almost a year ago. It's called the Partnership to Build America Act. And the Partnership to Build America Act, as of today, has 29 House Republicans on it and 29 House Democrats on it. It was also introduced in the Senate about a month ago with a dozen senators, also bipartisan. So right now, Mr. Speaker, the Partnership to Build America Act is the most significant piece of bipartisan economic legislation in the whole of the Congress. 
And what it does is it creates a large-scale infrastructure financing vehicle called the American Infrastructure Fund, which will be capitalized for 50 years and be used by states and local governments to build and finance infrastructure. But the money in the American Infrastructure Fund, Mr. Speaker, is not put in by the federal government, but it's put in by corporations who invest and buy very low-cost bonds to finance the American Infrastructure Fund over 50 years. And as an incentive to get them to put this money in, we allow them to bring back a certain amount of their uh, overseas earnings, their overseas cash, back to the United States tax-free. Almost half of corporate cash is sitting overseas because of flaws in our international tax system. This allows for over $200 billion of that money to come back, a quarter of which would have to be invested in the American Infrastructure Fund, and create a 50-year revolving financing vehicle to help close this gap. So, Mr. Speaker, the Partnership to Build America Act is a real example of bipartisan progress to solve an important problem facing this nation to get Americans to work, make us more competitive in the long term, and use our precious resources in a wise and prudent manner that pencils out. It will be the category killer for the financing challenge we have around infrastructure. So, Mr. Speaker, I'll close by reminding everyone of the importance of this issue. Investing in our infrastructure should be our top domestic economic priority. It should be our top jobs program. We should be bolstering all the ways we have in this nation to build our infrastructure. And the good news, Mr. Speaker, is we can do it in a bipartisan way. Thank you.